So we are in our study of Corinthians, and uh, we are in part two of this section on uh, things offered to idols. So uh, this is the basic outline of where we have been in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, Spent six chapters talking about things that were reported to the Apostle Paul. Now we're talking about things that were asked of the Apostle Paul, questions that were asked. First there were questions about marriage. And now we're in this section called Questions About Things Sacrificed to Idols. We had some introductory remarks last week about this, and I gave you this outline of the three chapters. This is my outline, uh, Weakness of the Brother. That's the first reason that Paul is saying no to eating meat offered to idols. Okay, so his answer to this question is no, don't eat meat offered to idols. Uh, But the first reason is Weakness of the Brother. The second one is the one we'll look at today, which is the worth of the gospel. And then the third is wickedness of the heart. So uh, now I want to, before we get into the passage, the key to understanding this question, what is the issue? What is it that they are asking about? All right, so we have this term in verse 1, things sacrificed to idols. And so I give you the Greek word there, and uh, the first section is idol, edol, edol lathutus, edol lathutus, toss, sorry, edol lathutos. All right, so idol sacrifices. The thutos has to do with sacrifices. The edol has to do with idols. Idol sacrifices. All right, and we have this verse in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, or 1 Corinthians 8, verse 10. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, that's what the issue is. They already knew that the church said, don't eat meat offered to idols. Acts 15, uh, it was decided in the Jerusalem Council, and then there was a letter sent out to the Gentile churches. And then after that incident, Paul then goes on his second missionary journey, and he, uh, he goes eventually to Corinth and starts this church. It's inconceivable that they would not have heard this instruction from him. So some of them have asked a question. So they know that the church in general has said, don't eat food offered to idols. And so, but they are in the habit, some of them, this is where you do business. This is the public place. So they're saying, look, what's wrong with going there and eating the meat? Because... Or, you know, the the food that's offered at the idol temple, because we know the idols aren't anything. They are not gods, and they have no influence over us, and it's a place where we do business. That's what they're saying. That's their justification. So Paul is dealing with that argument. And the term, this term, idol of Thutos, means an animal sacrificed in the presence of an idol and eaten in the temple precinct. So this is a very important distinction. Somebody will say, well, what about if you buy it in the marketplace and you don't know for sure that it's idle meat? He will touch on that, but that's chapter 10. Okay, so we're not talking about chapter 10 right now. We're talking about this question. You know, is it okay? Because the idol's nothing. He says, listen, for the weakness of the brother, that's the first reason, you don't eat meat offered to idols. Now, 1 Corinthians 9. The first thing we need to note is that Paul doesn't mention things sacrificed to idols at all in 1 Corinthians 9. So it's a, how shall we put it, it's, there is one verse, which we'll get to, which has maybe a reference to the subject. But the, overall, it's not mentioned once in this chapter. But what's interesting is, he he deals with it in chapter 8, he deals with it in chapter 10, and there are no logical breaks in the text where he says, I'm moving to a new topic. One of the things that we see in 1 Corinthians, he'll say, now concerning, you'll see that at the beginning of chapter 8, verse 1, now concerning things sacrificed to idols. You also see at the beginning of chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the things about which you wrote. So he's asking those questions about marriage. The next one that you see is going to be, uh, I think it's actually chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts. 
He does bring a different topic in chapter 11, verse 2. Now I praise you because you remember me and everything. So the word now is part of it. So there's a change of topic. Anyway, there's no change of topic. Uh, uh, or Excuse me, there's, there's no natural break, no logical break that is put into the text. So there's, it's not mentioned. So how are we justified in applying the teaching of chapter 9 to the things sacrificed to idols controversy? Now I'm posing that question to you, but I'm giving you a couple of hints. So first of all, oops, I guess I shouldn't show you that. That gives you the answer. First of all, it's context. So what do we know from the context? That is, that would say he's still dealing with his same subject. What do we know from the context? I've already, I've really given you the answer in what I just said, so hopefully, hopefully you have some grasp. All right, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so there's, there's, a quest, there's people who were eating in temples, and yes. Paul was reminding them of what was taught at the Jerusalem Council because it was causing problems in the church, and someone, I guess, some kind of reported to him those things. Yeah. On, and... Yes, that's right. You're getting there. Okay, but in our immediate context in the passage, what does the immediate context teach us that chapter 9 is still dealing with the same argument? What you've said is part of it, Lee. Uh, no, you're not putting it. Okay, I'll give you the answer. You're all just... You're, okay, so both chapter 8 and chapter 10 clearly discuss the issue, uh, making an inclusion. So there, we've got the, the clear discussion here, clear discussion here, that means everything in between is connected. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second issue is rhetoric. So chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Let's, I'll just read that to you. We'll have it on the screen in just a minute, but I'll just read it to you. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? So, what is Paul expressing here? Paul, in, in, in these verses, Paul expresses his, well, it's his apostleship, but something more than that. Liberty, Liberty? you're getting closer. Okay, there's another word that I want for you to come up with. Starts with R. Rights, Rights very good. Okay, very good. That's right. Paul expresses his rights, including the right to eat and drink. Now, the commentaries say, oh, well, he means more than just eating and drinking meat offered to idols or, or you know, liquid wine offerings offered to idols. However, in the context, there clearly has to be some kind of connection. All right, so to me, that does speak to it. But anyway, here's, so here's the answer. Paul expresses his rights, including the right to eat and drink, in context connected with chapter 8. All right. And so then I have a quote here from the commentaries. It seemed that the rumblings of doubt about his apostleship, which would later call forth uh, an extended defense, especially 2 Corinthians 10 through 13, had already started. So you remember, he is having a little bit of trouble with this church. And some of them are, there are some people around who are attacking his position within the church as an apostle and trying to discredit him. So that's part of what's going on in chapter 9. But overall, in my mind, this, is, this whole discussion in chapter 9 can be directly related and is intended to be directly related to the question of meat offered to idols. So let's work our way through the chapter and we will... Uh, see, you'll, I hope you'll see that uh, this reasoning is correct about this passage. All right, so here's our text. I'm going to read actually down to verse 7. I've already read the first four verses. Let me just pick up at verse 4. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense. 
Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? All right, so in verses 7 through 9, Paul uses... Uh, wait a minute. Uh, let me back up. Okay, so look over verses... Huh, I don't have... I don't have verse 11. Let me go over the next slide and we'll come back to this one. Okay, so then verse... I'm going to read down to verse 11. I am not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope, the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? All right, so the first question is, look over verses 7 through 11. What is the basic concept Paul is, discuss, is discussing in this discussion about rights? What's the basic thing that he's talking about? Emily? To be, have, receive support from the congregation. Okay, so the congregation, he's saying he should receive, or he has a right to receive, support from the congregation. Right? That's the concept that he's working on. The right of men in full-time ministry to be paid for their work. Now I want to go back now to uh, verses uh, 7 and verse, uh, verse 9. Paul uses what I call in the notes homely illustrations of the concept. So what are they? What are the illustrations he uses? Look at verse 7, first of all. There's three of them in that verse, so... I'm having trouble getting my, my mind read this morning. Call, uh, Lee? Like the, well, I think it's the second one, but the, about the vineyard. Like okay, so a vineyard owner, what does he do with his crops? He, he eats, he, yeah, he calls it, but he has a benefit from the, fro right. from the he, does, he eats the fruit of it. See, vineyard owner, plants a vineyard, he cultivates it, takes care of it. He benefits from that vineyard. All right, what's the first one that you've skipped over there? Because you're a soldier. So does a soldier go to war and not get paid? That was the whole point. Okay. In fact, it's quite interesting. I was just, I'm reading a book about, of course, about Roman history. And the author made the point that only citizens could be legionnaires in the Roman army. And the, uh, uh, and they, they had promises of, they had pay during their service. They also had promises of land at the end of their stint of 20 years or what it was. And so a lot of Roman colonies, like Philippi, were populated by retired Roman soldiers who had served their time and got their, you know, 40 acres of land or whatever it was. I don't know what they got. So, uh, but there were people who were, they had forces who were not legionnaires. They were people from all over the empire who were non-citizens. They might be a Gaul, they might be a German, they might be whatever. They got one-third of the pay of a legionnaire, but at the end of their stint of service, they could become citizens, and their children could become citizens. And you remember Paul says, I was born a citizen. So I wonder if that's how Paul's father got it. He's living in Tarsus, he's not living in Judea. So that's just a speculation. We don't know that for sure. But there are ways for people to gain citizenship, and that was one of them. Anyway, okay, so a soldier, he serves, and he gets something for it. That's the point. That's number one. Number two is the vineyard owner. What's number three? Okay, the shepherd, he, you know, he, he benefits from his flock, right? He drinks the milk of the flock, all right? So uh, now there's in verse 9, which is over here on this other slide, there's another illustration. What's the illustration in verse 9? The ox. So God, is, God gave this revelation in the Old Testament law. When they're threshing, they would have great big stones that they would lay out the grain on the threshing floor. They would have an ox uh, pulling a, uh, this rolling stone that would go over the grain, and then the, that would break the husk away from the 
from the grain and they'd throw it up in the air and they would get their, you know, the, gra- the chaff would blow away and they would get their grain. That's how they threshed the, the grain. Well, God said, do not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. Why? Because God, there's a principle that if somebody does the work, he should get some of the pay. And it's all right for that ox to take a mouthful or two of grain, right? But then Paul is going to teach us something from that illustration. In fact, says, God isn't concerned about oxen, is he? Why is he saying this? He's teaching it for our benefit, verse 10. All right, now in verse 11 to 13, Paul gets very specific. So I'm going to read those verses again, and then I want you to Uh, The question is, who does he list as having a right to be paid for rendering spiritual service? All right, so verse 11, if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we do not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? All right, so uh, he, he gives a list here of people having a right to be paid for rendering spiritual service. So what are they? What are the points? In verse 11, who's he talking about? The priest. Not, not in verse 11. You're right, the priests are later, but who's he talking about in verse 11? Yep. The apostles, the people. Yes, but specifically himself. Mm-hmm. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? So we're preaching and teaching you, is it too much that we get paid for that service? Mm-hmm. All right, so then, what's the one in verse 12? Okay, who's he mentioning in verse 12? Not himself in verse 12. Well, he does mention himself. Do we not more? Yes. But who, what, who are the others? Christ. Not Christ. No, not others in the secular world. Others who are serving in the same way. So, for example, remember the controversy that's in, in Corinth? Remember they said, oh, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. Now, presumably, we don't have any record of it, but presumably Peter or Cephas went to Corinth and ministered there. Apollos certainly did. The implication is that Peter and Apollos were paid for their services by the church of Corinth for their preaching. Right? That's the implication. Okay? So... um, that's verse 12. Verse 13, who's he talking about? The priests the priest in the temple. There you go. Now you get your answer. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to go over to the next section. Okay. Verse 14. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Okay. So Paul appeals to the Lord. Uh, well, let me read the whole thing and then we'll come back to this. But I have used none of these things, and I am not writing these things so that it will be done so in my case. For it would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward, but if against my will, I have stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. All right, so first question. In in verse 14, Paul appeals to the Lord himself who proclaimed this right. Is so also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Now, can anyone think of a passage where Jesus affirmed this? Paul is saying the Lord taught this. Can anyone think of a passage where this is said? Cullen? Oh, very good. You get a gold star today. He doesn't know where it's found, but he gets a gold star. Okay, let me give you the two references. Okay, Matthew 10, verse 9 and 10. Do not acquire, he's sending out the disciples on their 
traveling preaching tour, do not acquire gold or silver or copy, copper for your money belts, or a bag for your journey, or even two coats or sandals, or a staff, for the worker is worthy of his support. All right, and then a parallel passage in Luke. Luke uh, 10, verse 7. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. All right, so the Lord indeed did teach this concept. All right, so in verses 12b, oh, I don't have that on here on the screen. This is, I, my questions are jumping all over the place. So let's go back to 12b. All right, 12b, we endure all things. Okay, nevertheless, we did not use this right. That's the point I want you to see. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 12, we did not use this right. Now let's go back. Let's get past our, there we go. Now, and also in verses 15 to 18, what does Paul declare about his own practice? Okay, so what is he doing as a preacher of the gospel? And this, and this right of being paid for it. He's not taking the money. Okay, he's not taking the money. Now, is he saying this, so he's saying, you know, you guys have been cutting me short. Is he saying that? No. Lee? I think he wants to remove any confusion that there's like a financial motive. Right, he wants to remove a confusion that there's a financial motive, but he is very clearly establishing a right. Okay? He's, well, I've got a right. I have a right to this. Now, I, he said, where does he say this? Let's see. Verse uh, 15. I am not writing these things so it will be done so in my case. Okay? So he, he, has, he, he, does, not, he does not want them to pay him. And uh, he, uh, in fact, we know that he labored with his hands. He, he, not only for himself, but actually for his whole team. It's not like we have uh, just Paul. But usually Timothy's traveling with him, sometimes Silas, sometimes somebody else, Titus. And so there's a whole group of people. Paul, with his own hands, is supporting these people. Okay? And go ahead, Lee. Would they also have the same, like, just culturally, with, like these traveling uh, philosophers or something? Kind of like... Yeah, that's one of the concerns. That, that is one of the concerns, because there were these traveling philosophers who were going around giving speeches for money. Okay? However, Everybody understands. Like, if we have a visiting preacher come here, he has travel expenses, uh, you know, his time is worth something. So we have, we have a provision in our budget for guest speakers. And so when they come, we give them a generous offering, and uh, it helps them on their way. And, we, and everybody, I think everybody instinctively understands that. And, uh, and he's also saying, for example... That others in uh, here are not they're, they're going, they are receiving money for their support now um, it seems that Paul did receive some support from the church at Philippi. He mentions it in the book of Philippians, but it was after he had been there. he was off traveling other places and they sent a monetary gift to him. I think it was when he was in prison. <laughs> You know, he couldn't work his trade, and so they sent money to support him. All right, uh, Tola. Sir, is this not contradicting what Jesus said? That freely you receive, freely give. Okay, so. yes, but he is, he is saying, he is saying that, that the Lord established that there is a right for the laborer, <clears throat> he is worthy of his hire. Mm -hmm. And he is saying that others... For example, probably Peter and Apollos uh, were, they partook of this right. They, they, they were familiar, the Corinthians were familiar of paying for preachers to provide for their needs and their expenses while they are serving in this way. But Paul himself has made a commitment because he is itinerant and he's not local. He has a means of make, supporting himself and he is determined, I am not going to be accused of doing this for money. Okay, that's his principle. All right, so let's move on to the next section because I think this expands on this. <clears throat> I'll read the passage and then I have 
I guess two, well, no, just one question from this whole section. All right, uh, we are, uh, there is more to this passage than the, than the broad picture I'm, we're, we're going through here. We're going very quickly, but just walk, work through the logic with me. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may, may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things, now hear this, for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Now, what does Paul mean in verses 19 to 22 about his adaptability in ministry? What does he mean? What's he how is he describing what he's doing in his ministry? Verse 19 to 22. Look at the text there. Think about what he's saying. Emily? Okay. Okay, so he tries not to cause offense. So that means when he's in a Jewish context, what does he do? He doesn't act like a Gentile. When he's in a Gentile context, what does he do? He doesn't act like a Jew. Okay, he get, Now, he's a Jew, and they know he's a Jew. And there's certain culture, I mean, he probably he has an accent. I mean... Okay, I don't know what a Jewish accent sounds in Greek, but he probably has one. Okay, all right, and he, so he does. And and he, if if he's trying to reach people who are who are followers of Moses, then he will like he goes to Jerusalem and he he takes part in the in the vow. He says that's okay, I'll do that because I want to reach those people, and and, uh, and it says and to those who are without law as without law. But then he qualifies, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So that means when he's out amongst people who are Gentiles, he is not going to, you know, get over, he's not going to be following the Jewish ways and somehow cause them to think he's some kind of weirdo and they don't want to pay attention to what he has to say. But he does say, though not being without the law of God. In other words, there are some things, of course, I can't do. Okay, we've talked about conscience and places we would go and things like that. Now, with with uh, with uh, when I've been working with under, unbelievers and trying to witness to them, they understand that. You know, they, if they want to talk to me, we'll usually meet at a place that's suitable for both of us. Not, not. Uh, I'm not trying to impose my morality on them, but I'm. I'm. I, there's certain things I can't do, and so I won't do them. And they. And most of the time, people get along with that, go along with that. Tola. Can we call that humility? Pardon me? Can we call it humility? Humility, yes. I think that's humility. He's saying, look, I, I want to work with people. I want to be flexible. All right? I want to get the gospel across. All right, so what overarching principle do we find in verse 23? The last verse on this screen. Can you choose to do those things that just just for the sake of the, of the scripture of the gospel, and yes. not necessarily because he, he doesn't want he's not uh, he doesn't intend to be consistent in his ways. Yes, so he's doing it for the sake of the gospel, and he's not he's not a um, um, like he'll never do something that is against God's will. Mm -hmm. I think that's quite clear. That's where he says though, though not being without the law of God, but he says I am trying I am trying to do everything I can. Because the gospel is so important. I'm trying to be very adaptable. And this goes back even to his decision, I am going to forego my right to be paid. All right? That's one of the adaptations I have done in order that the gospel would be heard. That's the first thing. All right, now... Uh, so let me just go to the last section here. Okay. 
Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So in his final comments on the subject, what is Paul exhorting the Corinthians to do? Cal. I'm thinking that he is showing the importance of the gospel. It's, it's right above everything in Including being saved. That's right. That the, the focus has to be the gospel. That's right. The focus has to be the gospel. So I'm going to control. Like there's things I could do, okay, but I'm going to cut them out of my life because they're not going to contribute towards the gospel. Okay, that's basically what he's saying, and that's what he's urging them to do. He's saying, forego your rights for the sake of the gospel. All right. So, my last question in this is, how do we apply this teaching to the things offered to idols question? Right? And I want you to think about this. I have an answer, but I want you to think about it. I've said that this is the context. We're talking about things offered to the idols. Paul has rehearsed how he has a right to be paid, but he has chosen not to be paid. Why? Because the gospel's more important. All right, now, how do we apply this to things offered to idols? Helen? There's things that we can do, and we wouldn't be wrong in doing them, but they might become a barrier for someone else to receive the gospel, and therefore it's better not to. All right, so that's, that's exactly what it is. So Cullen says there are things we can do, but if we do them, it could be a hindrance to the gospel, Therefore, it's better to forego them for the sake of the gospel. All right? Lee, you want to add something to that? Oh, Christy's texting us. Okay, good. <laughs> is there a concern he would be considered double-minded or a hypocrite? Like if he's with certain, a certain group and runs into some Jews or vice versa with the Greeks and they're, you know, he's acting as a Jew in this case and then he sees his Greek counterparts, I guess. Well, I think I, I, I get what she's saying. The, the question is, 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 is he being double-minded or hypocritical in... He's not, but would he be perceived as that? Would some perceive him that way? Well, all I can say is, from the testimony Paul makes in the chapter here, he is doing everything to avoid that. So he's adapting himself to make sure that, that he is not... He's trying not to give an offense to anybody in presenting the gospel. Now, in the context, remember, we're talking about these Corinthians who are saying, look... These idols are nothing. We can go in there. We're just doing business deals. It's just part of life. It's not, we're not worshiping the idols. Now, Paul is saying, and, and they say, and besides, now we can eat wherever we want to. We have a right to eat, right? Paul says, verse 4, do we not have a right to eat and drink? Right? So here's the logic. I'm going to give you the logic. The gospel is more important than exercising my right to eat and drink things offered to idols, especially within the pagan temple precincts. A guy could argue, look, I've got a right to that. It's not anything, so you know, why are you bugging me? Well, Paul says, look, how, what are you saying? He's in the first chapter, verse eight, chapter 8, he's talking about the brother who has a weak conscience, a sensitive conscience. We talked about that last time. Here he's talking about the lost person who says, aren't you a Christian? Why are you doing that? And there are many things in this world where the lost people have a perception that Christians shouldn't do that. For example, if... Uh, uh, this is maybe extreme. But suppose you were going to a, mo a movie that had a clearly... Uh, certain things in it that would not be compatible with a Christian testimony. Let's put it that way. 
Can you imagine any movies like this? I'm, okay. All right. So, all right. So, and, a, and an unbeliever says to you, I thought you were a Christian. Why are you here? You see? That hinders the gospel. I forgo my rights. Do I have a right to go to that movie? Sure. Can I say it won't affect me? I'll close my eyes during that scene. Does that, can we do that? Well, yeah, I guess. But, re, but really, the issue is, is the gospel more important than you going to that movie? Or whatever. Put Fill in the blank. Whatever it is. Okay, Lee, go ahead. Well, even like on a practical sense, doesn't it give credibility to those things as well? At least in the eye of... That's the right. It gives credibility. So we have to be very careful. There are things that we can do in this world, and some of this... There comes a point where it does come down to conscience, and there are certain activities. Some people say, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head where, where well, okay, so I'll have one. I had this friend way back, this is like, oh man, I don't know how many years ago this was, 40 years ago. Uh, we were at a men's retreat and uh, at the Wilds in North Carolina. And uh, he said that um, he was talking to me about he had given up taking the newspaper, okay? And he had done it uh, because he felt that he was wasting too much time on the newspaper. It was hurting his spiritual life. Now, that's a matter of his conscience. So some of the decisions we make are matters of our conscience. For me, I mean, I, it doesn't bother me, okay? The time I waste on the newspaper it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother my conscience. Right? But, so what I'm trying to say is there are some decisions you make that come down to a matter of conscience where one Christian and another Christian might come up with different uh, conclusions. But whenever we are involved in something where we find out or we're aware that the lost person can question how much gospel we really have by doing that, then we need to say, you know, I don't need to do that. That's what he's saying. So the meat offered to idols. Yeah, okay, you could argue it's, the idol's nothing. Yeah, you could argue, yeah, you have a right to eat. But because of the worth of the gospel, I'm not going to eat that meat. Okay? And then we can apply it to various situations. Lee? Even if someone doesn't have any like preconceived understanding of, like I guess, proper Christian behavior or... Um, it could damage your testimony too when you try and share the gospel because you, you could find yourself in some contradictory yeah. places. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, I think in our culture, we do live, I want to put it this way, in North America, I don't, maybe those of you from, from other places can tell me whether it's like this where you are, but in North America, there is enough of a Christian tradition, like we used to consider... Canada, the United States, Britain, the West, to be Christian nations. Now, we know that that doesn't mean real Christians. We know it means just Christendom, okay? But there is enough of a consciousness that somebody who's a real Christian isn't going to do everything that the person in the world does. And many, even if they're not that well-versed, they may get everything in the Bible wrong. I remember our kids talking about other kids trying to describe the Bible at McDonald's, and it's like... I mean, they got it all mixed up. They don't understand. But they do have a sense that Christians should do some things and shouldn't do other things. Okay? If a Christian is known for cursing, what kind of a witness does he have? No? So this is a reason. Okay, so I'm not saying that you have a right to curse. I'm just saying that there are certain things that the world looks at you and says... I know what you should be. How come you're not? Now, I don't know. Is that some of you? Uh, you don't. Some of you from cultures that aren't exactly like ours. What is, is it similar there? Maybe it's more pronounced there even. Because somebody becomes a Christian, they don't go to the idol temples, right? They don't do that stuff anymore. Yeah. So it's a very real thing. These chapters are very real in in your home cultures, isn't it? Now go ahead. Others may, I cannot. The others may do it, yes, but I will never do it. That's right. Others may do it, but I cannot. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right, Marlene. Ultimately, behind everything he expressed was out of love for God and others. That's yeah. What I 
That's right. Love for God and love for others. That's exactly right. Yeah. All right, Marilyn. Would attending church be something that the unsaved would expect Christians to do? Would attending church be something that unsaved would expect Christians to do? I think so, yeah. Yeah, like, a, I mean, it's one thing. There's reasons why you can't come. You're sick. Or you're, you know, maybe you're out of town. There's no good church nearby that you know of. Okay, so that's one thing. But if, if you are, a, say you're a Christian, and you never go to church. Okay? Or you're very sporadic. Okay? There, that's, but we're getting a little bit further from, away from meat offered to idols when we get into that question. All right, uh, Lee, were you going to? Like, like, I, I think there is an understanding out here because it also creates hostility because of that understanding. Yeah, that's right. There is this expectation that you will have a certain. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes when they can catch you doing something that they think you shouldn't be doing, they say, aha, yeah. I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> right? It's, so it's very interesting how this all works out. Okay, so you got the gist of what I've said here. So the first reason that Paul is saying we should, uh, he's saying no to meat offered to idols because of the weakness of the brother. You could, you could cause a sensitive conscience believer to, be, to sin. The second reason is because of the worth of the gospel. The gospel is more important than all my rights, so I am willing to give up meat offered to idols or whatever else that will hinder the gospel. That's number, reason number two. Next week, we'll get into chapter 10. I hope we will finish it. I'm not sure, but it will be, then be the wickedness of the heart. You'll find out what that one is next time. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time that we've had today. We pray for your blessing on our services in the afternoon, on the lunch, and everything else that's going on. We pray that you'll continue to work in our church. Thank you for each one who is a part of this ministry and is, uh, is uh, desiring to serve you and love you and worship you. We pray that you'll bless us in our ministry here. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.